I am the terror that flaps in the night. I am the podcaster who never stops talking. I am Darkwing Duck. And you, good citizens, are listening to the St. Canard Files, a podcast all about me. <laughs> you lucky dogs. Uh, what are the royalties on something like this anyway? episode i want some tater tots i want some mashed potatoes some curly fries oh, and some french fries at mcdonald's you know nice and crispy i just want potatoes man i wonder why something about potatoes in this issue welcome to the saint canard files a dark wing duck podcast we're your hosts mike russo and tiffany silver Braun. hey what's up tiff nothing much <laughs> we are at the penultimate Joe Books Darkwing Duck issue and the penultimate Darkwing Duck comic issue in general, at least until Dynamite Comics gets going. Um, <laughs> how you feeling? Pretty good. <laughs> what do you think of this issue we're about to talk about? I love it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good one. And I know it's right it's, up your alley. Exactly. <laughs> there is a lot of stuff I know you'd love in this, starting from the very beginning. Um, I love this one too. This is like a sleeper issue. Um, yeah, the tone is great though. It's really, really great. Uh, but before we get there, uh, we don't have too much to talk about, you know, cause we, we're, we're blowing out these, uh, episodes pretty quickly. So no new news, nothing merchandise or whatever, but some of this issue takes place at Halloween and I, I know you love the holiday, um, so let's have a little Halloween discussion. I mean, this will drop in September, but still, you know, it's it's almost <laughs> there. You go to the store and there's Halloween stuff out already, so it's coming. Um, so Halloween memories and thoughts, Tiff. Um, cut loose. Yeah, I mean, I could talk about Halloween all day long. <laughs> I know you could. It's definitely my favorite holiday. I go all out with costumes usually um lately i haven't been too elaborate but yeah i almost always win costume contests <laughs> when i enter but what um, what was the most biggest costume you ever pulled off like what was the most dedicated thing you've ever done huh it's kind of hard to say <laughs> i know like some of the ones that i did were um that were bigger were like uh there was like a circus themed halloween thing so i did like the half and half like split down the middle like male and female like circus character right right it was, and it was it was really cool because that it was at a time when i had a mohawk so you know i had sh i was shaved on one side and i just like clipped this big blonde wig to the other side. And like, there was so many people that were like, did you shave half of your head for this Halloween costume? Yes. Yes, <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I had like a full beard on the other side and it was pretty elaborate. And that's, um, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. I've done, um, I did like a, a crazy like robot before where, um, it was kind of like an android and it was like all special effects makeup where I had it like my skin was peeling off and there was like chrome like robot like underneath where like my outer layer of skin was peeling off to reveal the robot. <laughs> nice. Um, I've done, let's see, I did Mrs. Butterworth once. Everyone loved that one. <laughs> you were, you were a bottle of syrup? Yep. That's funny. <laughs> and I had, um, an actual bottle of Mrs. Butterworth that I was using to like drink from all night. <laughs> oh, what you, you wash it, it out, you wash it <laughs> out and you put something in it. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> and I was wearing a mask. So it was like really creepy. Like it just looked straight up looked like the syrup bottle. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, tons of stuff. 
and last year I went as um, me and Greg went as the the doctors, the pig face doctors from Twilight Zone, and we were all black and white. I remember you told me about that. That's really <laughs> cool. I, I even saw photos of that last year. That is super cool. <laughs> I loved I love Twilight Zone. Me too. <laughs> yes, I I I don't go that far into halloween it's not my favorite holiday um christmas is but thanksgiving sneaking up on it Um, i guess as i'm getting older and i don't really get christmas presents anymore it's more about the food and uh thanksgiving is definitely the food holiday but i guess being able to see halloween through the eyes of my kid is really fun because you know it's nice to go trick-or-treating she loves dressing up and it's it's made me want to dress up a little bit more so that's yeah that's been fun not really crazy with the costumes although predictably for me the two times i really went out of my way to really dress up as something is but 10 years ago i was darkwing and last year i was negaduck nice (laughs) um which it turned out negaduck was an easier one to put together for whatever reason um finding a black and red cape was a lot easier than a a purple and pink one (laughs) I even bought a little toy chainsaw to go with it. That's awesome. So that was fun. Um, I don't dress up if I don't have to, but they they encourage it at work. And my daughter is like, you should dress up too, Daddy. I'm like, yeah, I probably should. I don't know what we're doing this year, but I think she's going to be Isabella from Encanto. So Um, maybe I'll be be Bruno. (laughs) Nice. That was what we did um, a couple of years ago that we won a costume a contest for was um, we went as Blockheads from Gumby. Nice. That one was really fun. My my favorite are the ones where you're wearing a mask and people can't tell who you are. <laughs> right. I mean, my problem with the um, the Darkwing and Negaduck is the mask is hard because I wear glasses. Yeah. So I can't. I ended up having to not use the mask because it was too much. And also with the turtleneck and the suit jacket, um, that gets hot. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know how Darkwing Duck does it, like wearing that much clothing. <laughs> like whenever an episode takes place somewhere, sometime when it's hot, I watch him and I'm like, dude, you must be sweating your feathers <laughs> off. Well, at least he's not wearing pants. <laughs> at least he's not wearing pants or shoes. So I, I guess there's a trade off there. Well, um, what about his summer costume? <laughs> Oh, yeah, the, the the tank top and the neckerchief <laughs> and the sandals and yeah. Um, but um, do you have anything in particular you like to watch on Halloween? Um, well, I'm like a huge horror person. So I try to do that 31 days of Halloween challenge where you watch a horror movie every night. Well, why don't we tie it into like the more family friendly stuff we talk about? Like, why don't we tie it into like family and Disney stuff? Like in particular. Oh, like the stuff that, yeah, or like the stuff I watch with the girls. It's yeah. Cool. The older they get, you know, we can watch more and more scary stuff, which we couldn't for a while. So yeah, we watch Casper. <laughs> from All the, right. We watch the Adams Family, one the first two from the nineties. Um, Hocus Pocus, of course, which I always loved. I know people either love it or hate it. The sequel's coming out next month. I know. I'm excited. <laughs> I got a um, an issue of D23 last week that had them on the cover. And I looked at it, I'm like, they must have covered these women in serious makeup because they look exactly how they did 30 years ago. Totally. So I'm like, either CGI or just really nice makeup because they look great. Yeah, it looks pretty good from the trailer. <laughs> Should be fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's see what else we, I don't know. Last year we watched that Muppets Haunted Mansion, which I thought, Eh. well, (laughs) yeah, but it was a million times better than the Haunted Mansion movie itself. (laughs) Yes. I just, modern Muppets are like kind of not my bag anymore. I tried (laughs) so hard to love modern Muppets and I just... I don't know. I kind of wish Disney didn't buy them because they clearly don't care about them. (laughs) But uh, anyway, it was cute, though. It wasn't terrible. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was all right. Um, they liked it. I cannot get used to Matt Vogel as Kermit, though. <laughs> yeah. That's not. I'm sorry. Um, now, Nightmare Before Christmas, is it a Halloween movie or is it a Christmas movie? Yeah, see, that's, you know, one of my all-time favorites, but it's it's kind of weird for both. Like, if you watch it for Halloween, it makes you frustrated when it gets to the Christmas aspects. And then for Christmas, it's really weird, too, because you're like, I'm going to watch this Christmas movie, and it starts off so heavily Halloween. <laughs> well, the, the word Christmas is in the title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's weird. It's kind of like a... You want to watch it when it's not Halloween or Christmas time. <laughs> and uh, Great Pumpkin? Uh, kind of. That's... Can... So for me, I I um, did not appreciate um, any of the Peanuts at all when I was a kid. So I don't have, like, childhood, like, oh. crazy childhood nostalgia for it. But as when I got older, I could really appreciate it, like, all the backgrounds and the Vince Guaraldi music and everything. I love it. Especially in The Great Pumpkin. Yeah. I like that more than the Christmas one. Yeah. But I don't have any childhood nostalgia for it. For it. Oh, I, we were Peanuts fiends as kids. My dad taped all <laughs> the Peanuts specials, even the crazy obscure ones. They made me, like, super sad. Like, um, Snoopy Come Home. <laughs> I love Snoopy Come Home. It made me so sad. I, like, cried. <laughs> So now, animated Disney, do you have something you watch for Halloween? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I like all the like, classic Disney, so definitely um, Ichabod and Mr. Toad. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's wonderful, Ichabod. That segment is so great. Yeah. I know we mentioned the skeleton dance last week. Yeah, we just watched um, Ichabod and Mr. Toad, like, a couple days ago, actually. <laughs> There's um, a lot of spooky uh, old Disney shorts. Yeah, Greg never saw it. Um, yeah, the old mill is pretty great. <laughs> uh, Haunted House. It's yeah. Black and white Mickey Shore. Mad Doctor. Oh, yeah, that one is crazy. It, it was scary to me as a you kid. Want, you want crazy? How about Pluto's Judgment Day? Oh, yeah, I love that one. <laughs> Donald and the Gorilla, Duck Pimples. Yep, so good. Though. There are a lot of great, creepy old Disney shorts. And Disney's Halloween Treat. I used to watch that all the time. Yeah. Kid. Disney's Halloween Treat. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> With the talking pumpkin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There were that? some specials too that had the uh, the magic mirror from Snow White it would come up and yeah. talk. With the voice of Captain Hook, I think. <laughs> they, voice. My favorite as a kid was remember the DTVs when they would do um, take a popular song and they would put episodes. Yep. They did Disney DTV Monster Hits. I think it came out in 87. And it was just, it was stuff like Ghostbusters, Thriller, <laughs> Thriller, um, Sweet Dreams, all these different songs and just clips from old cartoons. Yep. And it was, it was so great. Like, yeah. that was my favorite. I loved watching that. Um, but anyway, so let's get into today's comic. And again, very spooky. And this this issue, um, Joe Books number seven, the title is Dawn of the Day of the Return of the Living Spud. So <laughs> obviously it's a sequel to a very popular Darkwing Duck episode, but also explain like the four references in that title. So it's refer referencing the George Romero um, Dead series. So you got Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, and actually Return of the Living Dead isn't a George Romero movie. It was like a comedy parody of Night of the Living Dead and its own separate entity. But yeah, it was a movie in 1985. <laughs> and of course, the original um, Night of the Living Spud, that title's directly from the original George Romero, Night of the Living Dead, which is um, really good. I really enjoy that movie as bleak as yeah. all these zombie movies are. The first one has definitely got the most impact, even like 50 some odd years later. Yeah, so good. I think I, the Dead is my favorite, though. <laughs> that was that's the shopping mall one, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. OK, I get them a little mixed up because the, the, and, the, the and names are a little dead. little generic. They kind of yeah. inter inter intermingle a little bit for me. Day of the Dead is the one in the military underground military base with the zombie named Bub. 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a huge zombie fan because the, they're so bleak. You would not want to put yourself in the position of any character in those movies because it's just way too horrifying. I love um, it. <laughs> but yeah, I I totally get it. Um, zombies not my thing, but I appreciate the good zombie movies that do exist and the ones that definitely set the trends. Um, so okay, so before we get into the story, how about telling us what the cover looks like, Tiffany? So the cover has like a, it's kind of purplish or maroon, and you got um, a giant crowd of like potato people with their arms up looking like crazy zombies and a spiked um, curly vine sort of thing with Darkwing and Goslin standing on top of it and an ominous bush root in the background. And all of them have like crazy eyes on the cover. Darkwing has all white eyes. Bush root has all red eyes and Goslin's are all black. With like no pupils. Yeah. And it's a very dark cover, but there's like only one little hint of humor. Darkwing's got a potato peeler. <laughs> yep. Which is a direct reference to Land of the Living Spot. <laughs> it's a potato peeler. <laughs> <laughs> so um, speaking of Night of the Living Spot, so this issue, which was published January 2017, at this point they were skipping months. I don't remember that happening. But I, I, I don't know why, but here we are in 2017. This is a character you've confessed is one of your favorite Darkwing characters. <laughs> so why don't you tell our listeners how this issue starts? We see a little kind of swamp shack that's reminiscent of um, the beginning of Pirates of the Caribbean, like across from Blue Bayou. And you see... Your Pirates of the Caribbean, not mine, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, the Disneyland Pirates of the Caribbean. And um, you see Dwayne in a rocking chair whittling away. Dwayne? You see. know Dwayne? <laughs> <laughs> um, seemingly whittling, but he's actually peeling a potato. <laughs> he's got dialogue right from the episode. Yep. <laughs> Red taters you can reason with, but russets, they just plain yes, mean. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and uh, he says that he's preparing for the potato po- or potato apocalypse. <laughs> he mentions that he worked for the government, which he did say in the episode. Um, he said he's seen crazy stuff. He mentions the frozen aliens again. They were in the back of his truck. But he also mentions werewolf bar mitzvahs. Yep. That's <laughs> and, from uh, a show. Um, is it? Yeah. Let me try to remember. <laughs> well, will you try to remember, he also mentions Area 51 tunnels leading to the hollow earth, ruled by propeller beanies that walk like men. <laughs> it's, he's got to be making that one up. <laughs> it's from 30 Rock. That's what werewolf bar mitzvah is from. And it's a, they make a spooky Halloween song, and there's like a whole music video that everyone. I've can look up. never okay. seen Thirty Rock. There's so many like really popular things, TV shows I have not seen. I'm outing myself now. Community, Parks and Rec, Thirty Rock, Breaking Bad. I haven't seen a single episode of any of that stuff. Wow. <laughs> I know I'm weird, right? I never finished Breaking Bad, and I'm always worried that people are going to spoil the ending that happened a really long time ago. I wear it as a badge of honor. Also Game of Thrones. I love Game I'm of Thrones. I'm such a weirdo. Um, so he mentions the vampire potato. So we know where this is going. So he's going to tell us a story about what happened. So. And then you get another zombie reference. because he's 28 said, Days Tater. <laughs> yeah. Pretty great. So, he, so here we are on Halloween. And, you know, it's a typical Halloween. Kids are in costumes going trick-or-treating. Um, we see some references. We have three children dressed as Lock, Shock, and Barrel. From what movie again? Nightmare Before Christmas. Woo! <laughs> and Goslin and Honker are trick-or-treating. Um, tell, tell the world about what Goslin's dressed up as. <laughs> She's like a super disgusting... Um, wait, what is she called? An, an ooze monster? Wait, no, Frankenglob. 
and uh, she's got boils and a bug eye and hairy arms and hairy feet and really messed up teeth. And Honker's a cowboy. He's the cutest <laughs> little cowboy. Yep. <laughs> and of course, they, they go to her house where there's a husband and wife. The, the wife is dressed in like a June Lockhart kind of uh, 50s. She looks like Binky, actually. Yeah, totally. Only she's a dog. And her husband's got a pipe and like a sweater on with a, with a tie. <laughs> And they're so freaked out by Goslin, they give her all the candy. <laughs> yep. So just as Honker's about to pour more ooze onto her boils with a, you know, a tube of something, Darkwing shows up. So here's our first I Am the Terror. And she says, oh, great, here comes the party pooper. So we get I Am the Terror that flaps in the night. I am the box of raisins spoiling your Halloween <laughs> haul. I am. And what does the kid say? It's the Duck Avenger. And he goes... Sure, why not? <laughs> Donald is a Duck Avenger, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. So what happens next? So Darkwing's mad that Goslin took all the pillowcases because they were going to have a contest to see who could get the most candy. <laughs> Goslin knows how to do it. <laughs> and um, you see <laughs> the other other kids that are trick-or-treating pulling out their candy and one of them says I got a corn syrup bar and the other says I got a Kirby crackle bar which I don't know is that a reference to Jack Kirby I'm not possibly sure. although a corn <laughs> syrup bar has got to be really bad for you really yeah. bad for you in many different ways <laughs> and then honker says that he gets a potato <laughs> which is definitely a Charlie Brown reference only yeah. it isn't a, a rock it's a potato <laughs> so Darkwing looks into the bag. Honker mentions the potato was moving. Uh, vines shoot out of the bag, grab Darkwing. We see a panel that just says, what? And Darkwing wakes up in bed with a bandage on his head. Yep. And it what? looks super horror movie-y with, like, the, the tones are all purple and blue, nighttime tones. Completely, like, if it, wasn't, if it was TV, it would be color filtered. Yeah. Like, everything is a shade of blue. Uh, he wakes up, his head hurts, he comes downstairs, the house is a complete mess. He thinks she's playing hockey in the living room. He sees a closet boarded yeah. shut that says, don't open vegetables inside. Which is a Walking Dead reference to don't open dead inside from the first episode of The Walking Dead. <laughs> you would know, I would not, because <laughs> I am weird. Uh, Darkwing tears open the boards and he is attacked yeah by a bunch of little monstrous potatoes with um, sprouts coming out of their heads <laughs> a few good panels of him like karate chopping them they twist yeah. around his arms and legs yeah yeah definitely very horror <laughs> Very much so. This is cool. Like, the drawings are really awesome. The coloring yeah. is awesome. It's beautifully done. And the lighting is is really nice. Well, in the, in the panel where they're trying to feed him to the big potato and the light's coming in from the kitchen window, the way everything's bathed in light, it's beautiful and it's creepy. Yeah. But Darkwing is saved. Who saves Darkwing? Um, Launchpad bursts in with Goslin, and we get yet another Walking Dead reference. Because um, Launchpad is dressed up as Daryl Dixon, and he's got a crossbow. And Goslin, from when this comic book came out, I'm guessing that she's supposed to be Carl because she has Darkwing's hat on. But because there's another little girl that wears um, Rick's hat, it looks like Judith now. And I and think it, reading it now would think it's Judith, but because of when it came out, I think it's Carl. Any significance to the how her hair is over one of her eyes? Yeah, because he, the character Carl loses an eye. So I'm pretty sure that's why they did that. <laughs> so what happens next? So, um, yeah, they burst in and um, Goslin talks about how she's been hoping for a zombie invasion for years. <laughs> and um, you see that... Uh, um, Darkwing hit his head when Goslin, when a potato jumped on Darkwing's face and she whacked it off with a, a board. <laughs> I love the panel is like a thought balloon 
I guess it's Goslin's thought balloon of him just struggling with the potato. She's perched up on top of a fire hydrant with a two by four. And she is like two seconds away from cracking him in the skull with it. <laughs> yeah. It's really <laughs> great. So they hear a noise outside. It came from the Muddlefoots. The three of them run out. Uh, Darkwing changes into Drake. Almost forgets to take his mask off. Cute little touch. Yeah. And then the door opens and zombie Herb greets them. But <laughs> not really a zombie. It's just Herb in a mask. Yeah. He's got a what looks like um, a palm tree. And what shapes are those? Maybe On it's her- supposed to be a flamingo. He's definitely given up his watermelon and uh, banana Hawaiian shirts. Yeah. Those are a thing of the past. Who is Binky dressed as? I think she's supposed to be Elvira, but she doesn't have the low neckline. So it's kind of like a combo of Morticia and Elvira, but she's got the big giant hair like Elvira. But you know that Binky would also be modest, too. Yep. I don't think <laughs> yep. she dressed like Elvira. <laughs> But uh, this is actually, the next few pages actually gives Herb, like, a role in this comic. Like, this is super rare for any Darkwing Duck comic. Like, for Herb to actually do something. So this is actually, this is a lot of fun, this next scene. He he oh, takes, yes? You got one more, you got a D- Dawn of the Dead reference because they Wait. walk by, by the TV and the news reporters saying, when all the crispers are full, the vegetables shall walk the earth, which is like, um, when there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. <laughs> I knew that had to be from something. <laughs> so Herb takes Launchpad, Drake, and Goslin outside, and they notice that all the people in the neighborhood have uh, potatoes wrapped around their faces like um, uh, face huggers from Alien. Yep. <laughs> which is pretty creepy. Pretty creepy. Uh, doesn't bother Herb any, though. He just thinks they're potato masks. <laughs> so he shows Drake his Flash Fry 5600, a 5,600 gallon deep fryer. It's like sitting in his backyard like yeah. a swimming pool. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. And he mentions he's going to have the guys at Quackerware make a custom lid for it to keep the raccoons away. <laughs> so I'm going to assume every so often Herb has to pull skim a deep fried raccoon corpse <laughs> out of it. <laughs> it's dark, but I love it. <laughs> so Herb finally is convinced something is wrong. Um, there's definitely a problem. Starkwing mentions um, potato zombies are taking over, and we actually get a DuckTales reference. I don't know if you caught this. Herb says, taken over? You mean like Invasion of the Quacker Snatchers? <laughs> yeah. You, you remember that episode, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was uh, Send in the Clones. Yeah. And even Drake says, not everything is television, Herb. <laughs> so this is another Walking Dead reference, right? Yeah. Herb comes out, and he's dressed as Negan. <laughs> of all people, and he's got a spatula wrapped in barbed wire, so the spatula is like Lucille, the baseball bat. And I'm I'm guessing that character also wore leather jackets as well. Yeah, yeah. Pretty hardcore. Herb smacks these uh, potatoes, slices them apart, knocks them into the deep fryer, and is happy now they're going to have french fries for the party. (laughs) Yep, and in this he calls it Lucy, not Lucille. (laughs) Nice. So this is the end of uh, the Muddlefoots for this comic. They're all gone. We're not going to see any more Muddlefoots. But we go we go out on a really cool Herb scene. I'll be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so Drake realizes who the villain is. I think by now all of us have realized what the who the villain is going to be. Like there's no there's no hiding this one. We know. So they head off to the maximum security supervillain prison. Uh. More or less, for the criminally cunning he says. We get another <laughs> reference, but not a zombie movie. What does he say? Wait, which, where are you? When they're on the rat catcher. We get oh, a, yeah, you get a Back to the Future reference. Yep. Because well, they have it. We don't need roads. <laughs> yeah, because they have to travel by water. So the rat catcher does something it never did on the show. The tires 
turn sideways, inflate a little bit more, and then it becomes like a speedboat. It's pretty cool. Very cool. I, I wish they would have experimented more with stuff like this on the show. Because on the show, he never had a boat. Like, at any point. He had a submarine, but no boat. Weird. You'd think being on water where the, where the bridge is, he would have needed a boat once in a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they head over to the prison where Warden Dullard is still talking about how escape-proof this thing is. This guy's an idiot. <laughs> yeah. So what happened when what happens when Darkwing goes over to Bushroot cell? So then you get something reminiscent of another Darkwing episode. He goes to interrogate Bushroot, starts shaking him, and his head falls off. <laughs> and this becomes a running gag now. Goslin <laughs> takes the head and decides to hang around with it. Like it's her puppet. Yeah, she wants it as a souvenir. <laughs> so much like Twin Beaks, Bushroot is just a husk, and he escapes through the floor. Yeah. So that's definitely a talent he's able to do whenever he needs to escape something. So Warden Dullard admits now the prison needs to be called escape resistant and not escape proof. He wants to change it all to stationary. What a waste of taxpayer money, huh? <laughs> yep. <laughs> so what happens next, Tiff? So they're driving through town and they see everybody has these potatoes on their faces wreaking havoc. And um, they're following the seismic activity under the ground to see where the vines are going. Darkwing says, no time to treat the symptoms, Launchpad. We're hunting the disease and I'm the cure. And Goslin goes, you've been waiting a long time to use that one, haven't you? Every day for the last five months since I thought of it. <laughs> I love that. So they head back to the spot where Darkwing and Goslin fought the vampire potato Posey all that time ago. Yeah, and it says now entering Possum Holler, which is a reference to an old country song. But it also says home of Jake's prize winning cow, which is something that Dwayne says in Night of the Living Spud. Yep. <laughs> so Darkwing gives us a very quick rundown of what happened in that episode. And of course, the editor puts a little blurb telling us where to where to see that story. Very helpful, if you don't know Darkwing lore. And the drawing of Posey, though, looks way different than Night of the Living Spud version. She looks a lot less sleepy. Yep. Posey looked bored throughout the episode, <laughs> like she had better things to do. <laughs> like she resented being in the episode. <laughs> I love the silhouette of Darkwing creeping up a hill. Yep. To make it read better, they get rid of the cape. Mm -hmm. But there is such a Daffy Duck quality to that drawing. Yeah, you see his little tail feathers. Like <laughs> um, like Chuck Jones Daffy Duck. Mm -hmm. Like something from um, Drip Along Daffy or Duck Dodgers or Did You Say or something like that. Totally. It's very, very Daffy. Um, so it turns out the spot where they fought Posey is now a factory. What is this factory? It's a, a factory that manufactures genetically modified fruits and vegetables. So Launchpad says, what part does Bushroot play in all of this? He pops out of a large plant, and here's Bushroot. He says, they call to me, and he scares the crap out of the, the other three. <laughs> So finally, okay, this is why I truly love the story. We really haven't gotten a lot of, like, show-accurate bush roots so far. The closest we came was the whole Dr. Fossil scene. But that was very short. And over at Boom, we didn't get much of him. This is the first time where we're, we're getting a comic with bush root where I totally hear Tino. Yep. Darkwing takes out the gas guns, points it right at him, and Bushroot's like, whoa, 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 what is wrong with you? Why are you so aggressive? <laughs> <laughs> and then he calls out Darkwing for having a sidekick carrying around his disembodied head. <laughs> I don't yeah. even want to know why. <laughs> so Darkwing looks over at Goslin, and he's like, I guess that's a fair point. <laughs> <laughs> I hear, like, I hear Cummings, like, ending that, that word, Point. I hear yep. it. I totally yep. hear it. The writing's so good. <laughs> Why is Bushroot there? Um, Bushroot's been hearing voices of something in distress. 
and is going to help. He's actually on a a good mission this time. <laughs> I, I really like how this pretty much follows up the trajectory of Bushroot's character on the show. Like, if you put all of his episodes in production order, they go easier and easier on him until he's practically a good guy. Yep. And I really wish we had gotten more Bushroot episodes. Like, I don't understand why he wasn't in ABC season two, but I really would have liked to see them humanize him more, turn him into more of a anti-hero. That would have been fantastic. Yep. So this is pretty much what they're doing. This is how smart Sparrow and Silvani is. Like, this was like 25 years after the original show, but they're doing what Stones would have done with the character if he would have continued. Yep. Which is just beautiful. It's totally just, it's perfect. Um, Darkwing makes a really um, nasty chef salad reference, which causes <laughs> Bushroot to go, that is so offensive. <laughs> um, and Darkwing goes, let's get dangerous. And what does Bushroot say? Nobody likes it when you say that. <laughs> which is funnier than Megavolt had the same joke in the uh, Nightmare issue, but this is funnier. <laughs> this is absolutely funnier. Um, so in the next scene, we have a pretty obscure reference to something. What's going on here? So you see like the security guards of the factory and one of them says, you see that new VT-16? And the other one says, I'm not playing this game with you again, Carl. And I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure, like, we're going to have to get Stan's confirmation on this. I'm pretty sure that's a conversation that two stormtroopers have in the first Star Wars. Calling Stan Lon, calling Stan Lon. We yeah, need well, uh, info here. A new hope, very specifically. So <laughs> You could probably tell us, like, what, what time stamp in the movie it happens in. <laughs> no. Yep. So um, that's my guess. I'm not 100%. <laughs> your guess is better than mine, as it has been this entire episode. So Bushroot's vines come out of the ground, pull these two um, security guards down. Gosling cuts the phone wire, and the other cop that's there, the Darkwing says, lights out, rent a cop, and Launchpad puts a garbage can over the, the guy's head. So they're not impeded by security anymore. I can see that whole scene playing out in an episode. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, totally. I, and this is and Bushroot, another another perfect Bushroot line. Boy, this hero thing is kind of fun. I mean, I don't like the way you do it, but I can see the appeal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then Darkwing like totally like knocks him down a peg, tells him he's going right back in the cell when this is over. And Bushroot <laughs> goes, You are such a buzzkill. <laughs> And Goslin still has the Bushroot head. Yeah. Don't worry, Darkwing. We are a team that can't be beat, spelled B-E-E-T. <laughs> and and they, the puns, they're just terrible. You should all be ashamed. Holy moly. Again, I hear Tino. Um, so what do they see when they enter the next room? They see a room full of massive vegetables. Um, a diehard Darkwing Duck fan sees giant food and only can think of one thing. Yeah, we are going back, 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 back in Darkwing Duck history for yep. the next bunch of reveals, pretty much. Um, so yeah, you, it, you kind of suspect who might be behind it once you see the giant vegetables. <laughs> Bushroot says the vegetables are not there's something wrong about them. They're not part of the natural world. They're not calling him, but something in the other room must be. Um, what follows is the only scene in the issue like I'm really kind of cold on. Um Describe this next scene. Man, do I have to? All right. I'll do it. No problem. I'll do it. Uh, so Darkwing leaves Goslin and Launchpad to watch his six. And Goslin assumes that means that he's basically raising his expectations of her so that she can take over for him as Darkwing. And Launchpad has an unexpected reaction to it. He gets upset because he always figured he'd be Darkwing. And then he cries. Luckily, Gosling cuts the weird tension by saying, well, when I'm Darkwing Duck, I'm going to need a sidekick. And LP goes, hey, that's right. Woohoo, job security. Still. It's super weird because they're like, ta also just like talking about his inevitable demise. <laughs> but it's just also weird that 
I never really took Launchpad as wanting to take over as Darkwing. I always felt he was just happy being the sidekick and expected Goslin to take over. Yeah. He even says as much in UFO. I always got the impression that he wouldn't care who he'd be sidekick to as long as he got to do it. Yeah. And even then, I'd be okay with the dialogue if he wasn't crying. Mm-hmm. Like, he rubs his eyes and, like, cleans his beak. And it's... I feel like it's a bit out of character for Launchpad. He could be sad and melodramatic, but I couldn't... I can't see him crying. Mm-hmm. Like, crying dramatically. Like, Launchpad cries for comic effect, like in Dead Duck. I was gonna say, that's the only time I can, like, imagine him crying is in Dead but, Duck. But that was supposed to be funny. This is, like, he's sad. Only scene that I'm not feeling, but it's not terrible. So, Darkwing and Bushroot go in the next room. Darkwing says what we are all thinking. He says, not gonna lie, I feel like we telegraphed this one. And they <laughs> they absolutely did, because what do they see? They see it Posey strapped to a table in the middle of a, a, a grow room of vegetables. It looks like she has a colander on her head with water. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So the two of them jump down to Posey's level and start arguing with each other. Bushroot wants to save her. Darkwing thinks there's more going on here, that maybe keeping her contained is a good idea. They argue, they fight. He pulls on Bushroot's like little hair things that stick out. And then we get the big reveal of the issue that brings us back all the way back, all the way back in Darkwing history. Uh, bring us home, Tiff. So you see Dean Tightbill standing there. And behind him are Bushroot-ified versions of Dr. Gary and Dr. Larson. And of course, Dean Tightbill, voiced by the amazing Frank Welker. Yeah. So what do you think? Do you think in the original issue, Beauty and the Beat, Larson and Gary were actually dead? Because I've seen debate about that. Yeah, I don't know. Hmm. So does Bushroot have a body count? <laughs> huh he would be one of the few villains who actually does yeah <laughs> i mean i'd be fine if this is their ultimate fate they turn into like bizarre plant mutant mutants too um but it is pretty cool like one of the first aired episodes of darkwing duck featured characters getting killed that is yeah. pretty cool <laughs> so i know this surprised me when i first read this that they reached all the way back to Dean Tightbill at, and turned him into a villain of all things. <laughs> but we're not going to see much. We're not going to see any more of that for this issue. We are wrapping up with another character reveal. So finish us off here, Tiffany. So then we cut back to the city and we see more of the crazy monster potatoes attacking everybody and fire and chaos them like encroaching on a family and then all of a sudden you see like a hit by a, a what are they called mashed potato, potato masher yeah <laughs> mashed potato masher a mallet and a um, butter knife with butter and it's revealed that gizmo duck is there of course i did saint canard have no fear gizmo duck is here <laughs> it's the first indication that they're going to be throwing a lot of stuff at us because they know this comic is ending. Next week is going to be a little nuts. But I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So that wraps up Dawn of the Day of the Return of the Living Spud. I don't know if this is as long as Return of the Revenge of the Brain Teasers 2. I think they're pretty much tied. <laughs> Only this one doesn't have any exclamation points at the end of it. Um... <laughs> But what do you think of this one? Go ahead and rate it. I love it, and I would actually give it a nine to five. I'll give it a the... Go for it. Sorry. Oh, just despite the crying scene, I would still give it a five. I'm gonna give it a five too, and I'm I'm gonna be really offensive about it because it's such like a sleeper issue. It's it really. I mean, I think it's stronger when you compare it when you combine it with part two. But even on its own. I just love the Bushroot characterization so much that I'm yeah. really giving it a five just on how well it treats him. 
and the extended Herb Muddlefoot scene. Yep. Even without all the zombie references, that's more your thing. That doesn't do much for me. But as a Darkwing story, this is fantastic. Yeah. Any any further thoughts on that? Um, no, I I think it's great. I think it's even, you know, the characters that they bring back, it's not it doesn't feel um forced or anything like sometimes it does. Except when we get to Gizmo Duck. <laughs> yeah, a little bit with Gizmo Duck, but it's at the very end. <laughs> Although, if we're not counting Dangerous Currency as canon, the question of what happened to Gizmo Duck still did remain. Yeah. So, I guess they had to bring him back at some point. Um, so, yeah, great. I am looking forward to the next one. This one's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so, before we go, do you have a mini review? Yes. And it was tricky because we already did Night of the Living Spot. <laughs> so... Of course, instead of that, I have to pick Twin Beaks. <laughs> Which All right. I actually was really, I really wanted to do that episode on the show. <laughs> why, did, I, why didn't I, you? I don't know. I think I forgot to mention something. I also, you know what? We were coming off two episodes with no Will that I did with Bill. And I think we were just glad to have him back. So we just rolled with it. Yeah, I'm like a big Twin Peaks fan, so it was weird. <laughs> but go ahead, talk about the episode. So yeah, I love this episode. I'm it's is it Sun Woo this one too? Yes. Yeah, the I mean, the animation isn't you know, like Disney Australia or whatever, but I think it's pretty good. There isn't really anything like bad in it at all. It's At done. this point, Sun Woo has figured it out. Yeah, and the backgrounds are great. There's, like, a lot of, I don't know, I feel like usually there's, you know, they have their selection of, like, li little light motifs and stuff for the soundtrack, but this one actually has a lot of, like, Twin Peaks music that they put in it, and it's almost identical to the Angelo Badalamente soundtrack somehow. And I, I think the episode would have been a lot weaker without the music. The music totally brings the episode over the edge. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. And there's a lot of, you know, it's not just referencing Twin Peaks. It's also, oh, referencing um, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which is another, like, the original movie is, like, one of my favorite classic horror movies. Right, that's a good one. So, yeah, I love this one. And so, yeah, there's things that I feel like when you reviewed it, I just have to mention them because I think you guys weren't familiar with Twin Peaks. <laughs> I had a wiki it before I discussed it. I, I, I got some basic things like the diner and Aunt Trudy, but it, that was just me going off of the Wikipedia entry for the show. Yeah, so the, the diner with Aunt Trudy, um, there's a character Trudy who does work at the restaurant, but the eye patch and everything is actually based off the character Nadine, who wears an eye patch. Right, I remember <laughs> reading that. Yeah, and the Bushroot Corpse, that was yeah, from the Rap show, too. Yeah, is, like, Laura Palmer, and um, Launchpad with the Log is referencing Maggie, the Log Lady. <laughs> but even getting away from Body Snatchers and Twin Peaks, there are multiple Star Wars references, and the big one is the Far Side stuff. Yep, I come from the planet Larson on the far side of the galaxy. <laughs> you can tell the writers of Darkwing Duck love the far side easily yep. between larson and gary the scientist and yep. this episode oh you absolutely know they loved it yeah so it definitely like all comes together with and can we talk about the darkwing dream sequence <laughs> yeah i love that and i love that the end of that where he's just like all angry because it doesn't clear anything up I think that dream sequence is like one of Sun Wu's finest moments. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> I love the, the kick line of Muddlefoots. Yeah, and then the like Chernabog that turns into the cow. <laughs> Launch pad riding a cow over the moon. <laughs> yep. It's, it's a great stream of consciousness kind of scene. It really, really works. Yeah, it's, I think it's hilarious. I loved it when I was a kid. I, I don't know. It's it's definitely like I feel like it's pretty like bold 
to have a kids show and be referencing something like Twin Peaks and Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I don't know. I feel like that's for smart writers, at least. We're getting into the era of the crazy stuff that Tiny Toons and Animaniacs were about to do. I mean, Tiny Toons did a whole episode about 13 something, 30 something. They called it 13. <laughs> a whole episode on that. And just the crazy stuff Animaniacs ended up doing. That Heart of Darkness, Apocalypse Now, <laughs> yeah. the Orson Welles outtakes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one is so random and great. Like, when I was 14, I had no idea what the hell that was about. <laughs> yeah. Like, find me a way you can start a sentence emphasizing in and I'll make cheese for you. When I actually heard what he said, I was like, whoa, Tom Ruger and his crew had balls, man. <laughs> but you know what? Disney shows didn't do the kind of thing this episode did. Yeah. Like, name totally. me other Disney shows that, like, took something like that and parodied it. Totally. Yeah, it's, like, its own thing. It's pretty great. And, like, of all the things, Twin Peaks, it's... Which awesome. had been canceled for, like, a year before the episode even came out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they must have just been, like, big fans and, like, talking about it and wanted to do, like, their own tribute. <laughs> it's, you know, it's further example of how Darkwing was just lightning in a bottle. He had, like, Tad and, like, all the best writers at Disney working on this one great show. And they were able to have the creative freedom to do something like this. Like, yeah. Oof Troop wouldn't have done this. And I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was going to say this, too, like, as far as, like, childhood memories of it. That, like, beginning part where, you know, he's going to the prison to check on Bushroot. And he's, like, that husk of a like corpse scared me so much as a kid and I was like sad I was like what I like totally believed it I was like they killed Bushroot <laughs> and you know that um Frank and Gonis came up with zombie Bushroot for the new DuckTales because yeah. the Bushroot husk from this episode terrified him <laughs> that's awesome so I'm not the only one <laughs> no you're not but other stuff like the evil Herb and Binky scaring Honker. He doesn't quite want to attack them because they they look like his parents, but they're not. That's a pretty creepy oh, yeah. moment. I was going to say another like bold choice for a cartoon is like usually when they do anything where there's like twins or like doppelgangers or anything, they have to do something like, well, this one has like super dark eyebrows or this one's shirt is a different color because they want to make it absolutely clear. And this in this episode, they just 100% relied on, like, the voice actors, like, slightly changing their voices. Which Susan, I Susan Tolsky actually voiced evil Binky. Oh, really? That's creepy. <laughs> Where, like, Binky's, like, talking about, we're going to get ready for the harvest. Yeah. It's like, ooh. <laughs> yeah. And, like, the honker. But it's like, you get it right away. It's clear. It's not confusing. Like, I feel like sometimes when they try to do stuff like that, you might be like, wait, is that him or is that not him? And it's, like, so subtle, but it still works. Like, you don't question that they're the evil versions. <laughs> and then speaking of which, bringing in Bushroot as, like, the uncontested good guy. Yeah. Like, it's just five good guys. Launchpad, so Goslin, yeah. Honker, Darkwing, and Bushroot. Simple as that. Mutant plant duck, but I'm an Earth mutant plant duck. <laughs> that they'll not, they won't call us a bunch of pansies. Oh, sorry guys. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, Bushroot can't like be totally innocent. Like he, he potentially dooms mankind when the episode ends. Yeah, totally. They should have brought that back. <laughs> When was the last time you had a steak sandwich? Ah, uh, more of a peanut butter and jelly man myself. <laughs> and that's that's the one scene where like the sun animation goes totally off the rails. Yeah. Darkwing's got like the wrinkles and the height. There's one animator at Sun Woo who like must have been on crack or something. The way he drew the characters were like so strange. Yeah. <laughs> that last yeah. sequence is like Darkwing is like oozing and has got this high forehead. It's so funny. <laughs> I love Sun. I grew to love Sun Wu on Darkwing Duck. Other shows, like if I turned on Goof Troop or Bonkers and it was a Sun Wu show, I'd be like, okay, good. What's happening on Fox? But Darkwing, <laughs> I have no problem with their Darkwing stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's good too. Except for like freelance, every studio kind of had their own 
take on Darkwing, which totally worked. It's really hard to screw up Darkwing Duck. If you screw up Darkwing Duck, you don't know. You, that's that's rare. Like Heavy Mental? <laughs> heavy Mental's a good script. Yeah, I it mean. It just went but, to freelance. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't put Twin Beaks in my top 10, but I think it's definitely a top Darkwing episode. I actually might put it in my top 10. When I told Will I thought it was one of the best, he was actually surprised. <laughs> The writing is just really good. It's funny. Like, I actually laughed still when I watched that one. I'm pretty sure the writer was Jan Stranod, who's, like, a really big sci-fi fan. He I he writes sci-fi novels for a living. He's yeah. the one who wrote The Secret Origins of Darkwing Duck. So now you kind of get that kooky sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> but let's, let's, let's wrap up. We don't want to go too long discussing. It is one of the best Darkwing episodes. Um, yeah. But anyway, Tiffany, how can the fans find you? What can you plug tonight? Um, I'm on Instagram at Tiffany Silver Braun and at Regurgitating Gertie. And I'm on YouTube at CarneyTube and at Radioact Tiffany. All the usual stuff. <laughs> and speaking of all the usual stuff, that's where you're going to find the St. Canard Files. Um, any podcast app you enjoy, we're there, as well as YouTube. And there we go. So... Until next week, guys, everybody have a good, depending when you listen to this, good day, good night, good morning, good commute, good whatever. <laughs> um, so everybody uh, have a good one and stay dangerous. Bye. Have some French fries on me, guys. <laughs> good night. <laughs>